if you go to an Apple store and buy a new iPhone, just the primary chip will have 15 billion transistors on it. The rate of technological progress, it's a rate that's unparalleled in any other sector of the economy. Welcome to Pick Day's Founding Conversation Series. In this program, we talk to innovators, thought leaders, and scholars on the ideas that are set to shape the world of the future. My name is Hubertus Kolps, and today I'll be talking to Chris Miller, the author of Chip Wars, which is the Financial Times Book of the Year for 2022. Chris is an Associate Professor of History at the Fletcher School of Tufts in Boston, and he spent over five years researching this book which is on semiconductors and how they are affecting geopolitics and our world at large. But how does it happen that an expert on Russia writes a, a book on microchips, on semiconductors? Well, I started actually not planning to write a book about chips. I wanted to understand the evolution of technology and one of the key drivers of technological shifts is, is military technology, since military spend vast sums trying to produce the most advanced systems. And during the Cold War, both the US and the Soviet Union were both able to produce some of the key technologies of the early Cold War period. So think of atomic weapons or long range missile systems, space programs. But by the end of the Cold War, a vast gap had opened up in technological capabilities. And that seemed to me like a puzzle. Why was it that the Soviets could produce the key technologies in the early Cold War, but couldn't by the end? And it was a particular puzzle because a lot of the ingredients that you might think would be necessary, smart scientists, lots of capital investment, were present in the Soviet Union. And so I started digging into the evolution of these military systems and came to realize that Actually, the, the key differentiating factor wasn't any individual missile or plane. It was the application of computing power to all types of defense systems. And as I was doing that research, it actually became clear that it wasn't just the military that had been transformed by computing power. It was our entire society. And, and I'd, of course, been aware of computer chips before I started writing, but I'd never really come to terms with how critical they were in defining not just military power, but the entire modern economy. And, and that set me onto semiconductors as a topic which we all knew existed, but we'd never really fully thought through their implications. Yeah, it's odd. I mean, I, when I was preparing for this, I also thought, gosh, semiconductor, I probably should first read what is even a semiconductor <laughs> and what are the different types that exist. And quite quickly, you get lost because there's a lot, but maybe you can explain to our audience just in general, um, what is a chip? What is a semiconductor? So a chip is a piece of silicon, in most cases, often the size of your fingernail. Uh, and on that uh, piece of silicon are carved thousands, millions, often billions of tiny circuits. And the circuits are turned on and off by a switch uh, called a transistor. When the switch is on, the circuit's completed, and that produces a one. When the switch is off, the circuit's interrupted, that produces a zero. And all of the ones and zeros of digital computing, all software, uh, all data storage are just billions and billions of ones and zeros, which are nothing more than circuits on these tiny chips. So that's super fascinating. And I think what you, what you wrote in your book is that originally the first chip had, I think, four of these transistors. And today there are? If you go to an Apple store and buy a new iPhone, just the primary chip will have 15 billion transistors on it. So from four to 15 billion has been the the rate of technological progress, and it's, it's a rate that's unparalleled in any other sector of the economy. On, on the size of my fingernail? That's right. And so each, each one of those transistors in your phone, for example, is smaller than the size of a coronavirus. They're measured in nanometers, billionths of a meter. Um, how did it end up that Taiwan played such an important role. I mean, I think you said, you know, they're, they're particularly good, but in the, in the early days, in the, in the 50s and, and early 60s, um, the U.S. had the clear lead. I mean, these, these came from, from Texas Instruments. They were very early in, the, in that game, uh, along with a few others. And, and Taiwan was really far behind and almost had nothing. So how did it happen that they uh, got that lead? You know, I think that the number of players has just shrunk. So today there are only three firms that are anywhere close to producing cutting edge processor chips. There's TSMC in the lead, Samsung of South Korea behind them, and then Intel of the US, about two generations behind. And Samsung and Intel still have that model that they both design 
and produce. Um, and that's, I think, what analysts say is, is, in, is in, in the end, the difficulty for them. That's right. And in, in, Intel right now is trying to switch to the TSMC model of producing for external customers, but it's a hard switch to, to undertake. But, but these are the only three companies that are anywhere close. So there's, there's no new entrance in this business, uh, nor is there any risk of new entrance. 30 billion a year. Yeah, good luck. Good luck raising that. Let's move from there to, uh, to the geopolitical implications. And I think really the title of your book being being chip war, and I think what you alluded to at the very beginning, that uh, you know there, there's this race in a way between, well, initially between, when you were looking at it, between Russia and the West. Uh, but increasingly, I think when you look at it today, it's, uh, it's China and the West. And I think uh, the West still dominates, but uh, talk us through what's happening there and to what degree uh, China is catching up and what they've done. Well, today China remains quite far behind uh, when it comes to semiconductors. China spends as much money importing chips each year as it spends importing oil. And it does so because many types of chips can't be produced in China. Um, most smartphone chips, most PC chips, most data center chips, uh, China imports because they're more efficiently produced in Taiwan or in Korea. Um, now, China's been investing very heavily uh, since 2014 when Xi Jinping identified chips as a priority. And part of the Made in China 2025 policy was actually focused on semiconductors. And there's been some progress, but there's been less progress than you might have expected. Uh, and the reality is that for most types of chips, uh, China remains dependent on imports. China's manufacturing is three or so generations behind Taiwan and has been three generations behind Taiwan for the last decade. So Taiwan's improved, China's improved, the gap has remained the same. And when it comes to the tools that make chips, China's almost exclusively dependent on imports today. Uh, so across the value chain, China accounts for 6 to 8% of the industry's revenue, smaller than Taiwan, smaller than Korea, smaller than Japan, smaller than the Netherlands, uh, and certainly smaller than the United States. Um, but because of the role of chips in AI in particular, governments are focused on access to the most advanced chips and cutting off their rivals from getting access, uh, partly for commercial reasons, but more importantly for the military and intelligence ramifications. And if you you know, think of the ways that AI is going to transform the way you compute. It's going to have even more dramatic ramifications for the ways that intelligence agencies and militaries compute. And that's, that's why we've seen a lot more political interference in chip supply chains in recent years. And I mean, can you get more specific on that interference? I think I, it started really in earnest. Well, it existed before, but I think the, the first big you know, shot in a way was fired by the U.S. last October when they, when they um, started restricting certain, maybe you can explain you know, what they started restricting. So last October, the U.S. Uh, issued new export controls that had two main prongs. The first was to restrict the transfer into China of the chips that are used to train AI systems. So we mentioned NVIDIA, uh, their most advanced chips can no longer be sent to China. And the, the second part of the controls that the U.S. announced are designed to make it easier for companies like NVIDIA to defend their turf because the U.S. is also restricting the transfer of chip making tools into China. And so today, China's most advanced chip-making facilities are full of U.S., Japanese, and Dutch tools. And so now, because of agreement among these three companies, these three countries, uh, it's illegal for China to access the most advanced tools as well. So they can't get the most advanced AI chips, nor can they get the tools you need to produce the most advanced chips. I guess in, in the end, the, 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 the elephant in the room question is what happens if China invades Taiwan? Um, and uh, I guess that's also why we're seeing a trend um, and, and lots of you know, big government subsidies in, in the US, in Japan, and also in Europe. You know, the CHIP Act is the one that we know from the US in terms of nearshoring or onshoring production capabilities. Is that ever going to suffice? Uh, should that happen? And, and if it would happen, you know, what would be the consequences for the economy? Well, so if it happens, it'd be catastrophic. It's not just smartphones, although we would struggle to produce any smartphones without TSMC. It's not just PCs, even though a third to half of PC processors are made in Taiwan. Not just data centers, it's telecoms infrastructure. A cell phone tower is basically a, a metal pole with a bunch of semiconductors on top, many of which are made in Taiwan. But more than that, it's cars. So it, if a typical new car has a thousand chips, let's say 20% of those are made in Taiwan. Yeah, I, I heard that during the pandemic when there were already restrictions in terms of, uh, well, it was just difficult to produce in Taiwan, that uh, car manufacturers were buying washing machines. I don't know if, you, if this is true or not. Yep. And, and taking the chips out to put them in the cars is yep. true? That's right. That's right. Mm. Yeah, and, and 
car manufacturers over the past several years uh, suffered several hundred billion dollars in lost sales. So huge, huge financial costs. And what's striking about the chip shortages of the pandemic is that actually chip making increased globally. So the number of chips produced increased by 8% in 2020 and by double digit rates in 2021. It's just that demand grew faster. So the chip shortage was actually a demand surge rather than a supply problem. And so you mentioned that a third of new processing power each year comes from Taiwan. If that were to disappear, you know, good luck making not just a smartphone or a PC, but a car, an airplane, or even dishwashers, which don't require sophisticated chips, but they require a lot of chips. I, I think the most, the most frightening thing that I heard in the last several years is that ASML and applied materials, the, the companies that make the tools that make chips, both reported in 2022 they were struggling to meet their production targets because they couldn't get a enough access to semiconductors. Um, you would think that China would have no interest uh, at all in invading uh, Taiwan because in the end they would be um, you know, catastrophically impacting the world economy, which is which they're a very, very big part of. Um, so wh where do you see the risk of this happening and do you think that is a deterrent? Well, I, I hope it's a deterrent, but I think we shouldn't be overconfident in it. Um, We've just seen the opposite. Well, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So the 2022 gave us a good example of economically interconnected countries finding themselves on the opposite side of geopolitical disputes. In China itself, its clear policymaking has turned towards a more um, a security focused direction as opposed to the focus on economic growth that we had under Deng Xiaoping or Hu Jintao. But I, I think more important than the specifics are that history provides lots of examples of economically integrated countries that end up at war. I mean, I, I just think back to World War one, Britain and Germany were major trade and investment partners until they were at war, and then it was just weeks from the point World War I started until Britain was implementing a blockade designed to cut food imports into Germany and reduce civilian calorie consumption. It was, it was a weeks-long process from economically interconnected to starvation blockades, and, and so I, I worry that history doesn't suggest we should be too optimistic.